Broadcasting live from the North Fulton Business Radio X studio, it's time for To Your Health with Dr. Jim Morrow. To Your Health is brought to you by Morrow Family Medicine, an award-winning primary care practice, which brings the care back to health care. Hello, this is Dr. Jim Morrow with Morrow Family Medicine. Uh, we have offices in Cumming, Georgia and Milton, Georgia, right here in the middle of North Georgia. And we try to use state-of-the-art technology as well as old-fashioned care to bring you the best care we possibly can. We want to make you feel both cared for and appreciated. At Mara Family Medicine, we realize that you have many options and choices where you receive your health care, and we do appreciate it when that choice is Mara Family Medicine. I'm here in the Renaissance Bank on Windward Parkway in Alpharetta, Georgia, and the Business Radio North Fulton Studios, and I'm here with John Ray, my cohort in crime. How you doing, John? I'm great. How are you today? I'm good. I missed you last week. I came at the wrong day. Well, it's better to be early than late. Well, I was, <laughs> I was certainly early. I was certainly early. So last time we talked, we were talking with a couple of gentlemen from Georgia who are dealing with some very important issues and low THC oil as it's uh, become legal in Georgia and will start to be distributed over the next few years. And today we're going to talk about a completely different topic. Today we're going to talk about skin cancers. And we're going to talk about skin cancers in general uh, and some specific types in particular. This is a very important topic because we all are getting too much radiation from the sun. We all need to be aware of the fact that we are. We all need to be careful when it comes to our sun exposure, which is the number one cause of skin cancer. So if you, if you look across the, the population of Americans, it's, it's said that one in six people in America will at some point develop a skin cancer of some sort. That's about a third of all the cancers in the United States. Now, most people who develop skin cancer don't develop a life-threatening cancer. They develop what's called non-melanoma skin cancer, and there are two main types of those. There's basal cell cancers, or basal cell carcinoma, as it's called. And that's the most common tumor, if you will, the most common neoplasm around the world, and also squamous cell cancer. And these are both uh, cancers that can destroy tissues. They can give you a lifelong of problems if you don't take care of them. But in the majority of cases, they are not deadly. Um, the majority of these are, are taken care of with some surgery and occasionally some adjuvant therapy, but they're not deadly. But melanoma or malignant melanoma accounts for 75% of the deaths that are associated with skin cancer. So it is absolutely deadly, and it's a horrifying death in too many cases. It's a frightful thing, and it's one of those things that if you have it, you want to get rid of it, and you want to stay rid of it, and you want to do everything you can not to get malignant melanoma. Now, we're going to talk in specifics in a little bit about these different types of cancers, but regarding melanoma in particular, it's the eighth most common malignancy in the United States, and it has the most rapidly increasing incidence. And there are a few different reasons for that. But if you go back to the 1930s, about one in every 1,500 Americans might develop melanoma. And now it's one in every 100, maybe 105 people will get melanoma or likely to get melanoma. The non-melanoma skin cancers, the basal cell and squamous cell cancers, affect older persons and the melanoma rates really are peaking between the ages of 20 and 45. It kills more men than it does women. And you could easily make the argument that's because men are too stubborn to go to the doctor when they should and get things checked out. But it's still true. It does have a higher mortality rate in men than in women. And also, it, it kills more people who are black, African-American, uh, who are more likely to not be able to see the distinguishing characteristics of a melanoma. And one reason it's thought that it kills more men, too, is that it occurs on the back and men just are less likely to see it. The rising incidence over the last few decades is absolutely associated with sun exposure, societal changes, depletion of the ozone, that kind of thing. And if you know people that are visiting tanning beds, I encourage you to, to encourage them not to do that. It's one of the worst things you could do. The best thing that will happen is you will wrinkle early, and the worst thing is you could 
very definitely develop melanoma from that radiation that you get in the tanning bed. So with skin cancers in general, the first thing we want to try to do, of course, is to prevent skin cancer. Well, the way you prevent skin cancer is you limit your sun exposure, your radiation from the sun. So you want to avoid the sun during peak hours. And if you've heard anybody talk at all about this, you've heard them talk about not being outside between 10 and 4. 9 and 5 is even better. If you're going to go outside and work in the yard, go in the evening. Go first thing in the morning. Don't go in the middle of the day because the likelihood of you getting a sunburn, which is the kind of thing that can lead to a skin cancer of some sort, is obviously greater. If you're outside even in the wintertime and it's sunny and it's snowed, the reflection from the snow can increase your, uh, your radiation risk and it can increase your cancer risk. Same thing on the beach. I've seen patients that went to the beach and thought they were doing a great thing by putting up an umbrella, but they put up a white umbrella and the sun bounces off the, the sand and it bounces off the umbrella and it bounces onto them and it's been magnified and it's almost like a parabolic mirror just zooming the sun right in on them, causing all kind of trouble. My wife's a big believer in rash shirts for the grandchildren when we're at the lake and something like that's a very good idea to limit sun, screen, sun exposure. Pants, long sleeve shirts, sunglasses, hats, and not just a baseball cap. But if you're trying to limit your sun exposure, wear a hat with a wide brim. Wear a big old hat and, and don't be ashamed of it. Wear it with pride so that you can, can not have the little skin cancers on the tips of your ears that I see so many people with weekly almost. And then sunscreen. You want to use sunscreen when you're outside, period. That's the end of that sentence. You want to use a water resistant, especially if you're going to be in the water, that's pretty obvious, but a broad spectrum coverage that's at least an SPF of 30. If you use a number 30 in your sunscreen, you're going to block 97 or so percent of the sun's UVB rays. These are the most dangerous rays from the sun. And if you use that and reapply it every probably couple hours is a good idea, then you're a whole lot less likely to have sunburn, you're less likely to have sun damage, wrinkling, and eventually skin cancer. If you're swimming, if you're sweating, and if you're in Georgia, you're sweating, you really want to be careful about that. You can use higher number SPFs, but most of the research says that it really doesn't do a great deal more good and nothing's going to block 100% of the sun's UVB rays anyway. So prevention is a very important part of this. If you prevent it, it's just basically something you never have to deal with. If you get in a habit of doing these things, it just makes it second nature and there's nothing difficult about it. It's like raising a child to sit in a car seat. If you raise a child and you always have them in a car seat, they never raise cane about being in a car seat because they don't know any different. And if they're going outside and you're putting sunscreen on them, it's just what you do before you go outside. So I think that's something everyone should try to do. So later on in life, once you've been exposed to the sun, it's important to screen for skin cancer. And there's a world of disagreement in the medical community when it comes to screening for skin cancers. One entity will say you should screen everybody from the age of 20 on, and one will say you shouldn't screen at all, you should just encourage prevention, and one will say something else, and there's just too much debate but I think it's difficult to argue that if you're looking for it, you're more likely to find it. There's also no argument that early detection of skin cancer improves outcomes. Skin cancers grow from the skin deep, typically, and if you catch one before it gets very deep, then you have a much better opportunity, regardless of the type of skin cancer, to keep it from being something that completely alters this person's life or their features even. The ability to find skin cancers, however, varies greatly with physician training or clinician training. So except for the very high-risk persons with a history of skin cancer or atypical moles, there's considerable debate about who should be screened, but very few people argue that if you are at high risk, at some point you need to be screened. So in my opinion, which is what you get on this show, between the age of 20 and 39, you ought to have a complete skin exam at least every three years. Uh, very few people would argue that you shouldn't do it more than that, but I wouldn't wait any longer than three years. 
If you're 40 of older, then you ought to do it every single year. If you've been found to have pre-malignant lesions or uh, sun damage in a certain spot that might be something that could change to a cancer later on, then you probably should go more often than that. Every six months is a good idea in that situation. When you're getting screened, you want to always tell the physician or the clinician that you want a whole body exam. It's very simple. It's easy. It's lightning fast. It doesn't take long for them to screen you. And it's something that you will be glad you did if you're developing any sort of mole or lesion that could become a big problem for you. You obviously want to not be wearing a lot of makeup when you do this. You want to have a good light source. Daylight's ideal, but a little bit hard to come by in this particular setting. And taking photographs is a great idea because you can then see over the years how things change. Now, when physicians are looking at these moles, there's a rule that they try to go by to help them understand which, which mole might be a problem, which one might not be a problem. And that's the A, B, C, D, E rule. And if only everything in medicine was that simple. But it's A, B, C, D, E. It's asymmetry, where half of the mole doesn't really match the other. A part of it really doesn't look like the other part. Border irregularity. If you look at the border, it's not just smooth and round and perfectly circular. It's got irregular edges to it. Color that is not uniform. You might have a couple of different colors in the, in the, the mole or the skin lesion that you're looking at. Diameter greater than six millimeters. That's about the size of a pencil eraser on a number two Ticonderoga pencil, I'm sure. But a diameter greater than six millimeters, if it's larger than that, it could very well be a problem. And evolving size, shape, or color, which means it's changing. So if you have a mole that has these characteristics, any of these characteristics, then you want to be checked. So let's talk about specific things that can happen to your skin and specific neoplasms, as we call them, on the skin. So I talked about basal cell cancers, and we'll get to those, and squamous cell and melanomas. But before you get any of those, the sun damage spot that people get is called an actinic keratosis in most cases. Some people call them solar keratoses. But these arise from chronically sun-damaged areas or skin. And if you have a lot of sun damage, not only will you wrinkle, but you very likely might develop some of these crusty lesions that you can almost peel off that later on will just be there again and you do that again and it's constantly a problem for you. They're not very well defined. They're not round. They're usually irregular. And they can be tiny to fairly large, a couple of centimeters even, which is like an inch. And these are things that you can feel in most cases, but sometimes you can see them and can't feel them. But in most cases, you can feel them and they have a scaly sort of appearance to them. And you can have any number of them. There's no limit to how many of those you can have. These are the lesions that can later become squamous cell cancers. And so if you have anything like that, you want to get that taken care of before it becomes a bigger problem. If you go to the physician with an actinic keratosis, he's very likely to hit it with some quick liquid nitrogen and freeze it very lightly and you're done. And when it heals, it's gone completely and it's not a problem anymore. And if you wait until it's something more than that, then obviously it can be a lot more involved. You do see people, though, that have a lot of actinic keratoses. As you can imagine, everybody's reaction to the sun and to radiation is different. And in some cases, people will get covered in these actinic keratoses, these AKs we call them. I've seen situations where somebody on their scalp and forehead might have 25 of these things. Well, it's very difficult to freeze that many. So sometimes they'll use a topical chemotherapy agent called 5-FU or 5-fluorouracil that you apply very lightly. The patient will apply very lightly repeatedly to the skin, and it basically burns off the top layer of skin. So it's not something you really want to do, but it's a whole lot better than having skin cancers all over your scalp and, and forehead. And it's very effective. It can be a very worthwhile thing to do, and it can get you back to a much better baseline than where you are if you've already had all this sun damage. This is a very uncomfortable treatment, and I don't want to make that sound like I take that lightly because I don't, 
but the 5-FU is the essential, essentially the same as a chemical peel type of thing when it comes to the result that you end up with after you use it. And along with 5-FU, there's some other topical things like Retin-A people have heard about, facial dermabrasion, and actual chemical peeling. But the 5-FU is probably the most common thing that I've seen people use for multiple actinic keratoses. I want to remind you that this episode of To Your Health is brought to you by Mara Family Medicine. We have a walk-in hour at Morrow Family Medicine every weekday from 7.30 to 8.30. It's basically the first hour of our day. So that if you decide you have something that needs to get checked out, you can just be there between 7.30 and 8.30, Monday through Friday, either location, and we will see you and take care of you. That way there's never a day you can't be seen at Morrow Family Medicine. I want to tell you, too, if you want to reach out to the show, you can tweet us at To Your Health MD. Or you can email us at drjim at toyourhealth.md. And we'd love for you to do that and maybe send us some topics for shows. Or if you have questions or concerns or ideas about the topic of the day, we'd love to hear from you. And we'll try to get those questions answered while we're right here on the air. So I mentioned basal cell cancers, basal cell carcinomas. That's the most common neoplasm in the world, really. It's a it's a lesion that's usually located on the face or the backs of the hands because that's where we get so much sun exposure. They grow, they grow slowly. They're not real quick things, and they spread locally. They do not metastasize. So they, you won't get a basal cell on your face and end up with a cancer of any sort from that in your lung or anywhere else, which is a, a nice thing. But the bad thing about basal cell cancers is, is that the other name, the common name for them is a rodent ulcer. Because left alone and left to do their own thing, they will eat away the tissue wherever they are, just like a rat would. And I've seen too many instances, even in my own office, where someone lost part of their nose or part of their ear because it just basically vanished because this basal cell ate it away. So basal cells are very important to know about and to take care of. Uh, typically, when you have a basal cell, you want this ends up being cut out for definitive diagnosis and also so that you can be sure that the area around the cancer is cancer-free and it's not going to continue to grow. You don't want to freeze basal cell cancers. If you have what you think might be a basal cell, uh, you want somebody to cut that out, not to freeze it, because you can freeze the top of it and be left with cancer underneath the skin that can continue to grow and give you a problem. Most of these are going to be small. I've seen them the size of a, a pen prick almost to the size of a pencil eraser, as I mentioned earlier. But they can get a little bit larger even. The treatment for them is, as I mentioned, but if you have one that's in a cosmetically important place, ear, nose, face, that kind of thing, then it's not uncommon for patients to undergo what's called Mohs micrographic surgery. And if you know anybody that's had Mohs surgery, you've probably been amazed at the outcome because you can take under the right hands and a well-trained Mohs surgeon, you can take a basal cell cancer and remove it and take a flap of skin and move it over here and take this tissue and move it over there and not be able to tell that you just cut out something that's almost an inch in diameter from a, a very prominent part of a patient. And the outcomes are generally extremely good. And also doing Mohs surgery gives you a chance to be sure that the borders are clear and you're not going to have a recurrence. In places where you're not able to get all of the tumor or you're not sure you did, then a lot of times they'll use radiation therapy. And it's, uh, it's a very effective thing. It doesn't take a lot of radiation and it's a good way to ensure also that the cancer doesn't come back. And then the next one is, and still we're in this non-melanoma range, okay? We're talking about the non-melanoma cancers. The next one's squamous cell cancer. A squamous cell cancer or squamous cell carcinoma is the second most common skin cancer. It's about probably 20% of the cases of non-melanoma cancer. It's far and away the most common tumor in the elderly patient and usually results like the others from a, a lifetime of cumulative solar radiation, sun radiation. 
A new study has found recently that some types of the HPV, the human papillomavirus, may increase the risk of squamous cell skin cancers. Now, we've known for a while they could increase squamous cell head and neck cancers, but now a study has shown that they can also increase skin cancers of the squamous cell type. But many other things, irritants, exposure, genetics, can lead to squamous cell carcinoma. About 60% of the squamous cells will occur at the site where you had an actinic keratosis. So the one I was talking about earlier at the very beginning, that's not a true cancer yet, left to itself can become a squamous cell cancer. Now, one of the big differences between squamous cell cancer and basal cell is the squamous cell can metastasize. If you don't pay attention to a tumor or to a growth that is a squamous cell, you can end up with a huge problem because they can absolutely metastasize. And that's a much larger problem that requires systemic treatment and so forth. It's a whole different world from just cutting out something in the skin. About half of them probably, I'd say about half of them, occur on the head and neck. And that's a radiation thing, most likely. You also see them on the hands and arms, again, for the same reason. But they're small growths that you can feel, and they're not necessarily scaly at all. They're kind of nodular and hard. They can be any color from red, brown to pink, skin colored. Uh, And they can get very large, and they can get large in a hurry. So if you do have something that you think is a problem, you want to get that checked out quickly. You don't want to wait around for that to become a larger problem. I think it was back in my very first episode on the podcast that I I said that I preach to people and try to say to everybody that I can, not to say the five most dangerous words in the English language, which are, maybe it will go away. And there's no better example of that than when it comes to skin lesions, because they're things that you can see, they're things that are right there in front of you. And if you're if you're seeing something you haven't seen before, you need to be sure and tell somebody. Now, these squamous cells, they can be very aggressive. Uh, they can metastasize in a hurry. The most common uh, site for them to spread to are the lymph nodes and the lungs and probably the liver. But once they metastasize, the five-year cure rate is only 34%. This is a big deal. This is not just a bump on your skin. This is a great big deal that you want to be very cognizant of. You want to be very good about looking for this. And if you find something, you want to be sure and say something to somebody and get something done about it in a hurry. Now, again, just like with the basal cells, a lot of times the Mohs surgery uh, is is done to take care of these tumors. And just to explain Mohs surgery a little bit better, it's basically taking the smallest amount of tissue possible where the lesion is and sending it to the lab and waiting while the patient is not closed up, hadn't hadn't had the incision sewn up. But you send that to the lab, which is on site. You find out that the borders still have some cancer. So you go back in and take out a little bit more. You send that and check it. And if the borders still have some cancer, you do a little bit more. So instead of taking the largest possible excision, you take the smallest possible excision, but you end up doing it multiple times, and the outcome's really, really good. But everything about it and the success of it comes down to doing this early. And the cure rates doing this are probably in the neighborhood of 99%. And then the last most deadly skin cancer is melanoma, the malignant melanoma. Malignant melanoma has devastated people and families Uh, It's a a horrible thing if it's not found early. It's frightful at best if it is found early. And it's an important thing to talk about. So I want to talk some about the details about malignant melanoma. There are four types of malignant melanoma. There are two very common ones, the superficial spreading type, which is basically a mass of discolored skin that has all those characteristics I mentioned earlier. They're irregular, they're asymmetrical, they might have different colors, they're larger than a pencil eraser, and they're changing, that kind of thing. And this is probably 
it's probably 70%, three quarters probably, of all melanomas. And they usually occur in uh, people uh, between the ages of 20 and probably 45, but you certainly see them later on in life as well. They're commonly on the upper back of men and women. And for some reason on the legs and women, and that's probably a function of skirts versus pants, but I don't think anybody's ever really figured that out. And the other most common type of melanoma is what's called nodular. And I bring that up mainly because I don't want anybody to think that in order to have a melanoma, you have to have a brown patch on your skin because you don't. These things might be brown or they might not. They can even be uncolored. And there might be something you can feel more than you can see. These things uh, invade the skin just like traditional melanomas do or superficial spreading melanomas do. And the most important thing about success with treating these has to do with how deep in the skin they are when they're found and removed. So pretty obviously, the more shallow they are, the more superficial they are, the better results you're going to have in getting these things to not become a larger problem later on. Now, melanoma is like any other real cancer, systemic cancer that you might know about. They're going to result in trips to the oncologist. They're going to result in scans. They're going to result in surgery, probably to some degree, greater or lesser. And they're going to resort in a great deal of follow-up for the patient And it's important, it's extremely important that the patient do this follow-up and be very aware of having these follow-up exams so that not only are you getting another skin check to be sure you don't have another melanoma, but you're also getting checked by an oncologist to be sure that the one you had has not turned up somewhere else. And if you do that, then depending on the thickness and, and depth of the lesion when it was found, you can certainly have a good outcome. But melanoma is something that frightens people as it very well should and is something that everyone needs to be aware of. Don't ignore spots on your skin. They might not just be spots on your skin. It's very, very important. So the bottom line on skin cancer is fairly simple. The incidence of skin cancer is increasing by epidemic rates. The use of tanning beds has changed the risk of basal cell cancer one and a half times and squamous cell cancer probably two and a half times. The basal cell continues to be the most common skin lesion, but the most dangerous one is the melanoma. Aggressive growth and metastasis are features of melanoma and can be seen in some of the squamous cells. So this is something that you really want to be aware of. Find these things early. Remember the A, B, C, D, E, the asymmetry, the border, look at the color, the diameter. Is it bigger than a pencil eraser? And is it evolving or changing? Keep these things in your mind when you see something. Go to the doctor and get checked. Remember the safe sun measures, sun avoidance, wearing proper clothes, using sun tanning and and sun protection, and SPF of 30. If you do these things and you keep this podcast in mind when you've been out in the sun and when you're standing in front of the mirror, you can save yourself an entire lifetime of agony and treatment and misery and save your family an awful lot of the same as well. So I encourage everybody to do their best to do this and see if you can find things early and get rid of them and with any luck at all, prevent them in the first place. John, that's uh, skin cancers right there. Well, except for maybe a couple of questions we got here, if you're ready. I'm always ready. Fire away. Okay, cool. So got a question. You mentioned the need to get a full body exam or examination every three years? Early on, yeah. Is that something that your office can do, or do you have to go to a dermatologist? I personally go to a dermatologist. And I think that's what people should do. I think in a situation like this, you want somebody who is the most attuned to this kind of thing as they can be. And I'm a generalist, and I like doing things with a generalist. But in a situation like this, I think it's important to get screened like that by the specialist. Now, if you have a particular bump that you might have a question about, go to your family doctor. But if you're getting screened for skin cancer, I think you let the expert do that. 
Okay. And another question here. So this is coming from someone who says, I've been out in the sun for years. Do I have damage that I can't really re- at this point reverse? Yes, you do. That's the, that's the simple well, that, answer. That's good news. Yes, you do. Yeah. We all do. And you do not reverse sun damage at all. And that's, again, why it's so important to catch these things before they get too far down that road, because it's a direct path from sun damage to skin cancer. And so you can't reverse it. You can limit it. You can watch it, but you can't reverse it. That's that's it. That's what you got. On, on that cheery note. It is that. But the good thing about these skin cancers is you don't have to get a bad skin cancer. If you have something that changes, see your doctor, see somebody. So I really appreciate people listening. I hope if you like what you're hearing, you'll hit the subscribe button on your app so that you can continue to be notified when we have new podcasts, which, by the way, happen on the second and fourth Wednesday of the month. And for right now, that's all we have. And this is To Your Health.